One of the key predictors of success in software development is the ability of the development teams to make their own decisions. High performing teams can change the design, change their approach, change the software architecture without asking for the permission from anybody outside the team. This is what autonomy means for a team. So what are the implications of that and how do we organise to make our teams autonomous? Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel. If you haven't all already, please hit subscribe and if you enjoy the video, hit like and put some comments in below. In this episode, I will give you some advice on how to scale up your organisations with many small autonomous teams and how to decouple these teams, uh, both technically and organisationally, to allow for this vital autonomy. How do we know that autonomous teams produce better software faster though? Well, we have almost a decade of research data in the annual State of DevOps reports that tells us so. What this research has found uh, is that there are strong correlations with certain outcomes and behaviours. Uh, and these, this, this forms a predictive model in, in, based on the scores, instability and throughput. Organisations with high scores, instability and throughput make more money than organisations that don't. Um, they find it easier to recruit and retain higher quality staff. Uh, and these people that work in those organisations report significantly higher work-life balance. So this stuff really matters. This isn't just an academic exercise. You can use this correlative model the other way round too. One of the key predictors of high scores in stability and throughput is the autonomy of your development teams. Here are some characteristics of a team that the report says predict good outcomes and will end up with higher scores in stability and throughput. Teams are able to make large scale changes to the design of their system without permission from somebody outside the team. They're able to make large scale changes to the design of its system without depending on other teams to make changes to their systems or creating sig significant work for those other teams. Another predictor of good performance is that a team is able to complete its work without needing fine-grained communication and coordination with anybody outside of the team. They're also able to deploy their products or services on demand independently of other services or products uh, that your service depends upon. If we were describing a software system that had these characteristics rather than a human one, what we are describing here is the impact of coupling. Uh, as ever, there is no simple here. The problem is that there's great data on the importance of small teams in terms of both productivity and quality. So for bigger organisations, we want lots of people so that we can build big systems quickly. But we want small teams so that we can do a good job and do it efficiently. This feels like a bit of a contradiction. The degree to which different parts of an organisation need to communicate comes at a cost. But we want lots of small teams. So if we aren't careful, the cost of all of those small teams will be very high and a problem in, its, in itself. Therefore, they need to be small but they also need to be autonomous teams. Let's just think about this in really simple terms for a minute. Um, here's, here's, a, here's a team, and this team are working very closely together in a coordinated way, and they are moving forwards in step with one another. They are not done until everybody gets to the end of the journey. Uh, the problem here is if one part of the team uh, needs to move ahead more quickly or could move ahead more quickly, it's constrained by the others. If one of the others hits a, a, a pitfall along the way, um, then that's going to slow everybody down. You can only proceed at the pace of the slowest group in uh, a structure like this. 
uh, this gives severe limitations on how quickly progress can be made. The alternative, the kind of radical alternative, is to break the coupling between the teams and to let each team make progress independently. This way, the fastest teams will get to the finish line earliest and the slower teams will get there more slowly. Even in the event that one of the teams hits a problem along the route and maybe even never gets to the end, the teams that did make it to the destination have delivered something useful. So this is a, a good way of making progress more efficiently, in fact optimally. So decoupling teams is vital if we want to make progress efficiently. Naturally, this comes at a cost. There's always a cost. In this case, the cost is a trade-off in consistency. If each team can make its own decisions, Inevitably, people and teams are going to see things differently and do things differently. There will be duplication. There will be different teams solving the same problem in different ways. So the real question when thinking about this from an organisational point of view is what do you really want to optimise for? You can optimise for scalability and overall efficiency in which case you're going to prefer more autonomous teams. Or you can optimise to move more slowly, but have more consistency across the teams and have a more normalised solution, perhaps, if you, want, if you want to couple the teams more tightly. You can't have both of these things. There's always this trade-off. From a development team's perspective, the rubber meets the road in the decision to share code in some way between teams. If Team A and Team B share some code from Team C, uh, then clearly Teams A and B are coupled to Team C's code and via that to Team C's decision making. But they are also coupled to one another. These three teams are now in step. If Team C changes their, com their code and there's only one version in production, then Teams A and B are forced to change in step. Now the whole organisation is worrying about that coordination and of keeping everybody in step. If we want these teams to be autonomous, we've got to, be able to, we've got to allow them to make progress more independently of one another. We have to worry about this coupling and take it seriously in the way in which we organise our teams and encode the systems that we create. We need to worry about the coupling between the code and between the teams. There are a variety of tools and ideas that we can use to think about this and to manage it. The simplest of all is don't share any code between teams. This is kind of Partly the microservices way of thinking, perhaps. The downside with that is that, um, is that everyone has to solve every problem. Um, it's kind of workable at some kind of scale with some, in some kind of organisations, but it has its limitations. But even where you do want to share code at some level, it's worth really taking very, very seriously the cost of sharing any code at any time with another team. This is always going to be much more expensive than the code that you are working on and you own within your own team. Here are a few ideas that I will just throw out there for you to consider that I hope may be helpful in this context. First, at the organisational level, align your teams with a bounded context. A bounded context is an idea, a part of the problem domain in which concepts are close, more closely related than other parts of the problem domain. It's an idea from Eric Evans' book, Domain Driven Design. Again, link in the, in the description below. Aligning your teams with natural bounded context boundaries tends to reduce inter-team coupling to a minimum. It allows the conversations between the teams to be more abstract and, and a little bit more defensible in terms of reducing the coupling between teams. The next piece of advice that I would offer is to always capture requirements from the perspective of a user or at least a consumer of your service or system in some way. This tends to limit technical requirements which 
in turn tend to lead to naive, overly coupled implementations sometimes. And that can just lead teams down towards more tightly coupling the software with other teams. And that's, that's obviously what we're trying to avoid. Make all inter-team communication problem domain relevant. Ideally, if you were to somehow capture the conversation that is happening between the software that teams are responsible for, it ought to make up a kind of conversation that somebody who understood the problem domain, but not necessarily the software, would recognize. It's obviously going to be encoded in more technical uh, mechanisms, but the level of abstraction for those interactions should be at the level of the problem domain, rather at the kind of technical, tactical kind of uh, level that is very often common in bigger systems. At the more technical level, as we start thinking about actually the impact that this has on design and code, here are some more ideas. Always translate your inputs from another team. Always treat them as though they can break you, because they can. Adopt ports and adapters at the integration points uh, between teams, always translating what's, what's coming in, or always translating what's going out to, to, uh, to some degree, to make sure you've got this insulation layer that allows one team to move slightly more independently of another. Don't adopt don't the dry principle, don't repeat yourself, between services or teams. It's a fantastic principle and I really commend it very strongly within a team. You want one canonical version of any particular behavior within the, the, a team's boundary. But across teams, the downside of dry is coupling. If you start sharing code for any reason, you are always increasing coupling. And you want to, as we've already said, you always want to take those uh, risks seriously. The next piece of advice I think is kind of key and a bit more strategic. Consider very seriously the deployability of your team's work. What's the scope of deployment that you are, are, are in the system and the software that you are working on? Ideally, aim to make the output of every single team independently deployable. That's the microservices route. But this means that you deploy it without testing it with another team's work. That's what independent means. That's what autonomy means in this context. A continuous delivery deployment pipeline helps a great deal in focusing us on this deployability. The correct scope of a deployment pipeline is an independently deployable unit of software. So if teams are working on code that is not separable, then put the teams together in terms of repository, build systems, test systems, so that they are build, testing and deploying their software together. Two teams working in a shared code base in one repo is better than two teams working on separate versions of code that you are sometimes going to integrate later before releasing into production. You can learn more about how to create effective deployment pipelines in my training course, Anatomy of a Deployment Pipeline. There's a link in the description below. Consider contract testing to validate changes to the APIs that you produce, the, the interfaces between one team's work and another's, uh, and the APIs that you consume when you're reading information from somebody else that somebody else is produce, producing. Contract test those too so that you can spot any differences early. Design the public API to your code to keep secrets. You don't want to expose everything that your system knows or does to the world. You want to abstract the information that you present so that you can change your implementation behind your public API without changing the contract of exchange of information with other teams and services. Don't expose how your software or service works. Use only the essential bits of information in information that you're consuming from another team. Be parsimonious. Just take the stuff that you really need. Don't just read in all of that information because then you are coupled to it all. Just take the bits that you must. 
be generous, tell the story of what is happening in the information that you produce so that it's easier for people to pick the stuff that they're interested in when they're consuming it. I think that coupling both organisational and technical is probably the biggest problem in software development, certainly the biggest problem of trying to scale up software development. If we want to scale up, we need to compartmentalise. There's a lot more to this topic and on lots of different levels, but that's probably enough for now. So my advice to you is to always treat coupling thoughtfully and with a deal of caution, whatever form it takes. Getting the coupling right is the key to creating great software and great organisations. Thank you very much for watching.